Well, good evening and welcome. I'm very pleased that you were all able to make some time this evening to hear this talk. I'll be speaking about my paintings and drawings, uh, which some of which can be seen online at the Hewlett Woodmere Public Library. And for those of you who are familiar with that library, you know that it's the Art Library of Nassau County. Uh, I also want to talk about the uh, paintings that I have at the Heckscher Museum that just opened this week and will be there through January the 10th. And they are receiving people live and in person. Uh, reservations are required and masks are required. Uh, so they have a limited number of people, no more than 20. And in their 100th anniversary, the Heckscher Museum is uh, hosting uh, uh, 20 people at a time and celebrating uh, the Long Island Biennial by filling the entire museum uh, with the current show. And you'll see three works by myself in that exhibition, including the one that's on the screen, which is uh, fantasy on something that we don't see too often on Long Island, but you're familiar with this place, but not really, because it's an invented space that was inspired by a number of long distance drives on the Long Island Expressway. And I think you'll find that a lot of my paintings are depopulated uh, out of wishful thinking. So no traffic and just tuning out any of the noise and some of the distraction. I must have sat in traffic on this road a million times. So it becomes uh, an experience as well as something that is painted from memory rather than specificity. That's why you don't see the specific exits or specificity of place. But we know this as the Long Island Expressway. And that's the title, one of the three pieces that are currently in the Heckscher Show. Uh, so we'll come back around to this one a little bit later. Uh, but I'm going to work in a somewhat chronological narrative uh, to make sense of today's talk. So graduating in 1989 from graduate school with my MFA, uh, this was one of the pieces that I exhibited in my thesis exhibition. And I was interested in metaphysical still lives at the time and how still life inanimate objects could take on animated roles and characters could play parts, not unlike some of the Scuola Metaphysica artists of the early 20th century, like Giorgio Picerico and the early works by Morandi, uh, who have always been influential on myself as a painter. So that's from 1989. Uh, upon graduation, I received an IREX grant to go to Russia which was still the Soviet Union at the time, the USSR. And I was a little frightened about going there. Gorbachev was the president and they were starting to open up a little bit. They had uh, what's called perestroika and glasnost, which was uh, an opening and a cultural blossoming, but they were poor as dirt at the time. And it was evidenced when I got there uh, that Soviet communism had failed. And even in the big cities that I visited in Moscow and Leningrad at the time, now St. Petersburg, uh, they were really impoverished and hurting and they needed to open up for Western dollars. Uh, aside from the economic blight that I experienced, I made some lifelong friends and the art was blossoming, but the people were not doing well under communism. And it's a system that I learned a lot about while I was there, uh, but one that made me appreciate American democracy and uh, our, our form of government so much better. So in Moscow, I was introduced to some of the sites that I had to see. I was hosted by the Academy of Art and uh, the woman who ran the Academy of Art was a very good personal friend of Rockwell Kent's widow as Rockwell Kent, a famous uh, early 20th century American artist and student of Robert Henry had given all of his life's works to Russia back in the 1930s or 40s. And he had passed away and oh, probably the 60s, his widow had outlived him and was living in upstate New York. And the Academy of Arts director had asked me if I would be so kind to deliver a letter, as people in Russia never expected the mail to be uh, trustworthy, as uh, we here in America can thank the United States Postal Service for being the most trustworthy federal agency, uh, bar the current uh, administration. So I was brought around by the Academy of Arts throughout Russia. I was brought to St. Petersburg and hosted by a very gracious art historian who then came to New York and I took him around. And through this contact, I was able to meet Andrew Wyeth and made some really great uh, connections just out of graduate school. So 
Uh, in Russia, I was introduced to the Golden Ring, Suzdal, Novgorod, and Vladimir. And this is the church that William Blake, as I was told, referred to as the most beautiful church in all of Russia. So of course I had to paint it, and that was the first thing that I did. I did some drawings while I was there, and most of my work develops from memory, drawings, and then I recreate it when I get back home uh, to my New York studio. So this is in Kolomenskaya, just outside on the borders of Moscow, a place that William Blake referred to as the most beautiful church in all of Moscow. Also, while I was there, I did this uh, uh, monastery, which was one of many that I did from the Moscow series. And this was a series that was probably about 30 or 40 paintings that came out of this uh, experience uh, from my Moscow experience. Okay, I'm sorry, we have a Zoom bomber that's uh, drawing on the screen and we'll uh, make sure that they're apprehended at this point. I'm gonna have to clear those off. I'm not who's sure who that is. Okay. Um, what should we do, Tom? I've never had this before. Okay, well. It's easy to repair, it's just uh, annoying. And um, who, who is doing this? Can you tell? Yep, I know exactly who it is. Okay. Can, should we dump them? Where, dump the person? Who is it? Yeah. Um, it's the, it's the without the screen right underneath your uh, name. You, you don't know the name? Uh, it's a blank screen without the name on it. All right. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Okay, let me just see who. Okay, so what I need to do is go back to that. All right. Okay, uh, it's cleaned up, and if they come back, uh, they'll be visited by the, uh, the thought police from Moscow, so we're still in contact with them. Hot All right, back to the uh, Russia series. Um, this was also done in 1989, and in the aftermath of my visit there, and I probably did about 30 or 40 paintings from that Russian experience, which uh, I think had a profound influence on me as a young developing artist at the time, where I was exposed to art. I was uh, looking at some of the Byzantine icons while I was traveling throughout the Golden Ring of Russia. And it was a real eye-opening experience and certainly made me very, very happy that I was an American uh, from that experience. In about 1990, 1991, I started to do a series of paintings called the labor paintings. And also from the series, there were probably about 30 or 40. I'm just gonna show you two this evening. Uh, the first of which is Sacco and Vanzetti, which is the story about uh, two Italian immigrants who came to America and were accused of a crime that they did not commit. And through that uh, experience, uh, they were later immortalized by Ben Shahn in a series of paintings that he did. Uh, this is my variation on Ben Shahn and the story that I had uh, interpreted and digested. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti are the two images in the niches and there's a number of references to their profession, a simple shoe cobbler and a fishmonger who was blacklisted because of his union activity. And as a fellow unionist, I can uh, share some simpatico with unionism in the early 20th century, but because they were from a place that were perceived as threats or anarchists, uh, they were eventually electrocuted. And the predella panel on the bottom is something that I intended to read like a Renaissance altarpiece. So you see them on the bottom coming to America on the left, uh, the paymaster and guard who they were accused of killing, uh, the repentant thief in the fifth panel who confessed to the crime, uh, but nonetheless they were executed uh, for a crime that they did not commit. And there's text behind the three scales and also the blood, which is the blood of the innocent men uh, who died, not for what they did, but for what they represented as anarchists in early 20th century America. So the scales of justice are tipped, except the sixth panel on the bottom when it's over the words of Sacco, who writes a beautiful letter to his child from his prison cell just before he's executed. Uh, so that's the passion of Sacco and Vanzetti from the early 1990s. I also did this, which is the great postal strike of 1970. And this is something 
which I painted around 96, 97. And this would later be turned into uh, the most circulated image I've ever created. There were 5,000 lithographic prints made from the painting and eventually one, uh, every state in the country eventually would uh, have an, an image of this as many of the unions, uh, the National Postal Workers, NALC, and the APWU uh, would purchase this um, to commemorate the strike in 1970. So it just celebrated its 50th anniversary uh, this year in March and the interest of the subject was reawakened and uh, my father who was an active member in the strike and myself were interviewed on NPR uh, that's archived on one of their programs and also this year in May of 2020 this became the cover of a book that I'll show you a little bit later uh, but first before we get there we're still in the 1990s and developing some early works these are the mythopoetic paintings and in this work I wanted to tell stories using figurative elements from Greek mythology and some of the human condition that is a constant ongoing struggle as an artist. So this is the story of the plight of Marcius, who's the upside down hung guy who's being skinned alive because he had the audacity to challenge the god of music, Apollo, who's the cool guy in the shade on the left playing the lute. He thought that he was a better musician and by challenging him to a musical competition, he would be humbled by having his skin removed and stretched over a barrel as a drum. Now the guy on the right with big ears that might resemble me is King Midas. And Midas was the champion of Marcius, but Midas made a terrible, terrible decision in preferring the music of the passionate Marcius over the classical, more um, uh, academic Apollo, so he would also be punished by being given the ears of a donkey for not being able to differentiate. And as an artist, I've always appreciated the emotional as well as the intellectual, and trying to bridge those has been an ongoing struggle in my work and a pursuit that I've continued to attempt to do over 25 years. There, there are a lot of art historical references because those of you who know me as an art history professor uh, would know that there's always going to be some references to ancient history, mythology, art history. In fact, uh, the relief sculpture on the right that King Midas sits on is a reference to Marcel Duchamp's bicycle wheel and chair. Also in the shadow underneath uh, Midas is a reference to the Minotaur, the half man, half bull. There's an upside down silhouette portrait of Marcel Duchamp in the rocks. And there's also a Greek frieze of the Gigantomachia, the battle between the gods underneath Apollo. Uh, but this is the age old story that you'll find in every Greek myth, whether it's theater, art, or literature. It's the theme of hubris, which means pride, always leading to pathos. And I think we see that daily in the newspapers and the news of our time the boastful and prideful always be, uh, become humbled through a suffering and a fate worse than death, which is what eventually would happen to Marcius. Also from that mythopoetic series, this is the Psychostasis or uh, the Book of the Dead, which is based on Egyptian uh, scrolls and prayers for the dead. I had a friend from Seacliff, New York, uh, who was uh, somebody who nearly died. And in that near-death experience uh, that was relayed to me, I wanted to retell that in the psychostasis. So there's a few recognizable models along the way, but the guy in white would be the surrogate for Osiris, who sits in judgment as the person who nearly died is presented by, in Egyptian mythology, would be Horus. And those are the references to the bird just above Horus here, uh, the lion in a surrogate role to Anubis, who weighs the heart against the feather of Mott, and being recorded by Toth, the god of scribes. But it's straight out of the iconography of the British Library and British Museum's Psychostasis, or Book of the Dead, but incorporating Renaissance perspective in this uh, narrative story. In 1994, I made my first study abroad trip, and it's something that I completely designed from top to bottom. I decided where I wanted to go and I brought a number of students there. And that was the beginning of about 20 plus trips over the next 
uh, 25 years that would culminate basically in a working trip to Europe almost every year. And I would go to Italy every other year and someplace else in Europe, either England, Spain, Belgium, France, or Holland, or sometimes uh, once to Greece, uh, those would be alternating trips that would allow me to travel. I would teach, so I was working, but then I would have downtime to make drawings, and that became the beginning of a love affair with European landscapes that started uh, as early as 1994. And I can only paint from live experiences, personal experiences that I've seen, interpreted, experienced. And then when I get back to my studio in New York, I interpret what I remember, editing out the superfluous details. So this is from Siena. This is from Rome in the Campo dei Fiori. And I oftentimes try to stay in a hotel that has a view, as that's uh, something that I look for. Uh, I apologize, the earliest works that you're gonna see today are not the clearest slides. I don't have these images anymore and they were translated from slides. The digital images will be a lot clearer, uh, but this is my view of Toledo from uh, the late 90s. And this was later exhibited in the National Academy Design Museum. And it uh, earned me the Edward Palmer Award in Painting at the National Academy of Design, which was a great honor. Not with students, but as a personal trip, I went to Jerusalem. I always wanted to visit the Holy Land and to see with my own eyes uh, what Jerusalem was like. And standing on the Mount of Olives, looking at the Temple Mount, uh, this was inspired despite uh, meeting some really bratty kids up on that hill who uh, were little thieves that wanted to uh, take advantage of a foreigner. But I managed to survive that and uh, did this painting of Jerusalem after my return to my Brooklyn studio. This is from Assisi, also from a number of trips that I made personally and a few trips that I made uh, with student groups to Italy. And in the early 1990s, I also started a series that culminated in 13 paintings that I called Vanitas and Hubris, uh, two Latin words that uh, Vanitas is vanity, Hubris, which is a Greek and then incorporated into the Latin as well, it means pride. So vanity and uh, Hubris is like the subject that I described in the mythopoetic painting a few moments ago about Marcius, uh, but this is all about ethnic cleansing. And I wanted to use a pop image, which explains the detergent era. Uh, the skull is a reference to the frailty of human life. And the, the fly, which you'll see just above that opening of a Baroque space where the teeth of the skull come into our space, uh, the fly is a symbol of the ephemerality of life. It uh, feasts on the death and it uh, rejuvenates uh, in the next cycle of life. So there would be 13 paintings that all have skulls and cleaning products. And this is what I call Vanitas and Hubris, which was my response to the horrors, just horrors that I was reading about related to ethnic cleansing that was taking place in Azerbaijan and in Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Union and all hell breaking loose in places like Yugoslavia where uh, they were at war with each other. This is also from that series. As I said, there are 13 and they all are two feet by two feet square. And I'll talk a little bit more about my fascination with the square in just a few moments. Uh, but first this series that followed up in about 1996, 97, it's a series of baseballs that I called American icons. And the American icons all have medieval backgrounds, gold leaf and decorative backgrounds that have uh, sometimes Renaissance, sometimes uh, some late medieval designs, but they're all from places that I had seen and experienced in my travels throughout Italy and Europe. So in the backgrounds, you'll see references to the Gothic stained glass window in the middle left with the dark background. Uh, that's a rose window from the Gothic era. On the bottom, there are references to Celtic manuscripts. Uh, so all of the backgrounds are referential to the Middle Ages, and the baseball is the constant, which is repeated in each one. I wanted to create a type of secular symbol that takes the place of worship and religion, 
that a secular society has moved towards in the modern era. And we see large gatherings in sporting events uh, where people engage in something that's uh, a little bit more nationalistic and collective than the spirituality that brought people together in the Middle Ages. Uh, so I call these American icons, and all told there were about 40 of these. Uh, there are 29 here and another nine here. I would hang these only in series of threes and fours because those are sacred numbers that repeat over and over again in the game of baseball. The pitching count of three strikes or four balls, nine innings. Uh, so these numerological references were important in the way that they were displayed. And uh, on the middle left, the background is from a church in Florence, San Miniato, the one on the hill overlooking the city, and the alternating ones, top left, top right, bottom left and bottom right and center, are gold leaf. It's real gold uh, that's been done in the medieval manner, just like an icon might be done in a church uh, that one would look in uh, sacred art. About 1998, 99, uh, through the early 2000s, I was renting a space in Dumbo, Brooklyn. In fact, I was there 18 years old, all told. I arrived in Dumbo, Brooklyn when it was vacant and uh, you didn't venture out of your immediate space after dark as it was quite a dangerous place in 1990. And today it's become so uh, uninhabitable because there are baby strollers and uh, fancy cars parked on the streets and it doesn't have the appeal or the attraction that brought me there in 1990. So staying there from 1990 until 2007 when I was cured of ever renting from a New York City landlord ever again, uh, this was the view from my second studio in Dumbo, which on a clear day, I could see not only the East River and the overpass of the Manhattan Bridge, but a clear shot of the Chrysler Building. So it was really prime real estate in what was at the time undesirable real estate. And I was renting a space that had previously been rented by Michael Milkin, the junk bond guy who got uh, himself imprisoned, got into some trouble. The entire floor that I rented on was part of his storage facility. So basically large shells of industrial buildings that were mostly used for storage that then the developer wanted to bring artists into uh, to tame the neighborhood a little bit to make it uh, more populated before it went to the yuppies and the trust fund kids uh, that live there today. So as I said, Dumbo doesn't have the appeal in how it's transformed from when I first got there, but I was attracted to Dumbo because of the beauty of the architecture and the way that the light played off of these historical buildings, most of which were from the 19th century. And this is from uh, the series that I painted in Dumbo for about 18 years. And I've gone back to Dumbo in Brooklyn over the years. Uh, this is Water Street looking in the direction towards the Manhattan Bridge from just underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, which would be overhead and behind where I was standing in the middle of the street. You really could stand in the middle of the street back then. There were no cars. Anybody who parked their car there would usually find it on cinder blocks or gone. Uh, there were occasionally bodies in the dumpsters. It was rough. And uh, bringing the artists in was the beginning of the conversion of the neighborhood uh, that gentrified things and made it undesirable for artists eventually. So that, that's what cured me of renting as I saw the transformation from something that appealed to me initially, and then something that no longer had that appeal once the modern architecture started to overwhelm those beautiful 19th century buildings that brought me there in the first place. From the BQE looking towards Dumbo, this was the view that I would be sitting in traffic, getting to my studio every day, going and coming home. The streets around Dumbo, this is Adam Street, which is right around the block. The buildings on the right used to be owned by the Jehovah Witnesses that came and went and they had their own private parking lot, uh, but that's about the only activity during the days. And then after five o'clock, all of the businesses shut up and there were very few people on the streets who were uh, not going to venture out. So the Dumbo paintings were shown in a Chelsea gallery in 2007 and this was one of the walls from the gallery that I realized 
I'm working in a lot of squares. And the square is something that just subconsciously entered into my work. And it probably has a lot to do with my going to school at Yale and studying the works of Joseph Albers, the Dean of Color Theory. And I just was always attracted to Albers' color theory, as well as his geometric formalism. And he did a whole series of the homage to the square. So the square is the anti format for landscapes. And I wanted to create landscapes that had more of a geometric formalism and less to do with the traditional wide landscape format. And that's my best explanation of why I adopted so many two by two square foot paintings. Uh, so the three on the right are from New York City and the three on the left are from uh, Coney Island on the far left and two from Long Island, which we'll get to in a moment. So these are some of the paintings, uh, not looking towards the East River, but my wraparound studio, which was a mirrored image of the building on the far right here. I had 10 windows on a corner space of 1600 square feet that I then subdivided and shared with two other artists. And it was one of the most creative spaces uh, that I could find at the time. And it just appealed to me. So I stayed there for 18 years in two separate spaces. Uh, this is from the studio, as I mentioned, and across the hall, uh, the street from me, which is Water Street, the purplish gray building on the right, is where they stored the New York City voting booths, those old electronic booths before they changed it to paper ballots, the ones that we all voted in 10 years ago. And that's where they were stored, so nobody came or left other than polling and November's election week. Uh, so that was my neighbor and neighborhood, very quiet and very desolate after hours. And the roar of the train coming across the Manhattan Bridge is still a fond memory, as well as the trucks that would downshift uh, as it uh, came across the Manhattan Bridge. It was a very cacophonous space because of the buildings and the quietness after hours. So the outer boroughs have always had an appeal to me, and they still do. I find the outer boroughs some of the most interesting of all of New York City and the outskirts of Manhattan, like the High Line, which we saw earlier behind Nadine. This is Coney Island, which is one of the paintings that was in the Billis show in 2007. And also in that show is this one, which is the ramp leading up to the 59th Street Bridge and the Silver Cup Studio. Now, you would never find empty streets here until the pandemic, and there was a new interest in these works and people said, are these all done during the lockdown and the pandemic? I said, no, actually I was doing these back in 2007 for my gallery show, but I like to organize and simplify the roadways and not see the things that I find really menacing and distracting, the traffic. So this is my entrance in Williamsburg leading up to the Williamsburg Bridge, also from around 2008, 2009 and this is the underbelly of the BQE, which hangs in the president of Farmingdale State College's house today. Uh, he had um, approached me and asked uh, if he could hang a few of the works that you're seeing today in his uh, home. And I think we have the greatest president at Farmingdale State College. He's a really upstanding guy, an FDR historian. He went to Brooklyn College and remembered this space. So I said, of course, John, anything you'd like. Uh, so he has three of my paintings in his uh, home on the campus of Farmingdale. And I'm kind of uh, happy that he appreciates this uh, in his home. So this is the underbelly of the BQE down by Red Hook, uh, which is just a short walk uh, from where I used to live in Carroll Gardens, walking to the Dumbo studio. Now, not a square format, but also some of the outer boroughs in Brooklyn and fascinating over the way that light falls through these uh, over hanging elevated subway tracks, uh, which you only find in the outer boroughs today. They removed all the New York City, Manhattan overpasses and elevated uh, train tracks, but you'll find them throughout Queens, the Bronx, and uh, Brooklyn today. This is from Brooklyn. I had uh, brought my car to be repaired in a really dangerous and seedy area. And while I was waiting for my car to be repaired, uh, because I could only bring it to that place. Uh, long story that I'll tell you another time. Uh, this was what I was doing sketching, 
and trying to stay out of trouble while the car was being repaired. And I was attracted to the way that light falls across the surface of the building, as well as the way that the light creates these geometric shapes on the roadway uh, moving across because of the overhead elevated train tracks. I'm also a long fan of a number of artists who I think about all the time in my own works, like Edward Hopper and Vermeer, uh, who are referenced in that invented graffiti that's on the storefronts uh, with the closed grates. So Eduardo and uh, Op on the far right for Op Art uh, is actually Edward Hopper, a reference to him. And Mir is how uh, Johannes van der Meer, Jan Vermeer, used to sign his name. So I figured they should be uh, incorporated in this painting because that's what I'm thinking about when I'm constructing a landscape and light in my spaces. Now, an odd off painting from about 2005, uh, this was done after a summer of smoking engine. And I just thought, okay, I've got to get rid of this car, time for a new car. And in 2005, I had a couple of cans of this rate radiator repair called gunk uh, in my studio because I had to put it into the radiator uh, because my car was just smoking. I was losing fluids and I was wondering, okay, what's going on here? Uh, they can't find the, the problem. So I bought a can of this and sure enough, you dump it into the radiator and it seals up all the uh, areas that it might be leaking out of. And even though I'm a big fan of Kurt Vonnegut, who uh, was a dealer of sobs on Cape Cod in his uh, many hats before he was known as the famous writer we know him as today. Kurt Vonnegut, in his own words, said the only reason he never got the Nobel Writing Prize is that the Swedes were very disappointed with him for criticizing the Saab automobile. And he gave up on Saab's, shut down his dealership on Cape Cod because uh, one day he was trying to sell a car and as he took a customer out, it was smoking, and I experienced the same exact smoking engine before getting that radiator repair. So this uh, has to do with my sob story and my love of Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, there's a lot more than just a can of radiator repair called gunk underlying that uh, little painting. And it's a small one, maybe about the size, life-size can of that radiator gunk repair. Returning to Europe in 2004, first on a personal trip to scout out places that I might want to paint. I booked a hotel room on the top floor in the off season of Athens and tourists don't go to Greece in the winter. And that's exactly why I wanted to go in the off season where I could get my choice of optimum hotel rooms with a view of the Acropolis. And that's where I painted this work. Uh, I went twice in 2004. I got the same exact room in the same hotel uh, once in the early part of the year, about March, when I went during spring break, just uh, myself and a friend. And then I returned with a group of students, 20 students who were traveling with me through Greece that winter. And it was on both ends of the Olympics. So everybody who was going to go to Greece went that summer in 2004. I went before and after and got the best deals on the hotels and my choice of rooms. So the room has a view of the Acropolis and that's where I did this painting after two trips. The first trip I did the drawings and then I went back for scouting out that painting so I can finish it later that year uh, from Athens, Greece. And a lot of my paintings I think result in museum uh, or rather hotel trips uh, that I can look out the window and have a great view. And that comes back around in my hotel that I rented in Lucca on a number of occasions. This painting is from Amsterdam and it resulted from a trip to the Rijksmuseum around 2006. I had a layover on my way to Egypt. Uh, of all places, I stopped in Amsterdam. So of course you have to see something on your way. And I went to the Rijksmuseum, which was in the annex. It had not yet been renovated as it's all completely reopened today. And I stood on this line on the coldest day of the year. And I thought, okay, I have to busy myself and I have to do some sketching. So I stood on that line that was filled with people from about where I'm standing here to the front door, and it seemed like it never moved. So becoming busy drawing and making myself uh, try to lose sight of the frigid cold of the day, 
Uh, the drawing resulted from that experience waiting online with thousands of people waiting to get into the museum, which was a tenth of its size during that renovation period. And then the Vermeer reference on the right is again a reference to one of my favorite artists. So references to Leonardo Vermeer and Hopper are not uncommon in my works. The same trip that I went to Amsterdam on a stopover, I went to the Valley of the Kings, where I had a chance to witness the balloons that went up just at the start of the day. And driving out in the western banks of the Nile to visit the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, uh, that is what inspired this painting, which was completely done from memory when I got back home to my Brooklyn studio. Also, working on this uh, from drawings on location and then painting it when I got back to my New York studio here in Long Island. This is the Charles Bridge in Prague. And about 2014 is the first time that I visited Luca. I've been going to Florence, Italy since 1986, almost once a year or as often as I could but I had never gone west in Tuscany to see Lucca and the surrounding areas until I got an invitation to teach at a painting workshop in Borgo e Mozzano. And I'll talk about that next, but this was one of the paintings from the train station that I would wait for that one train that would come every two hours. If you missed it, you were out of luck and you'd have to wait a very long time. But this is near the studio where a friend who had invited me to teach and bring a group of students each summer. Uh, this is near where he lived, and this is that single train, again, standing around for a very long period of time, uh, every day for several years uh, during the time that I was there, for two weeks at a time. This uh, resulted from that experience, again, painted from memory. And coming back to Florence and one of the memorable views from the roof deck of the Uffizi Gallery with the Palazzo Vecchio on the right, that's the Duomo in the center. Uh, I've returned to the same hotel in Florence three times now. It's called the Hotel Boccaccio, and it's a place that I personally like to stay because it's very close to the rail station, the bus, and one of my favorite restaurants in all of Florence. Uh, so it's just very conveniently located, and you could get around in Florence by foot. But this is the view from the balcony looking towards, in the direction towards the Arno, uh, from the Hotel Boccaccio. And I've stayed there three times. It was only after the third time that I stayed there uh, that I did this painting from memory and from sketches uh, that accumulated over the years. In 2018, I brought a group of students with a colleague of mine from Farmingdale State College, and we went to Rome and then Florence. I chose the hotel in Rome, right by the Fontana di Trevi, and she cho chose the hotel in Florence. And I just lucked out with one of the best views in the entire hotel, the Hotel Lanza, which is the name of this painting. And it has a view of not only the Palazzo Vecchio straight ahead, but also the Bargello, which is that thin tower on the left. And I stood there drawing the clay roof tiles uh, for quite some hours while I was in Florence, but again, I created the painting when I got back to my New York studio. And as one of my colleagues commented when I showed this in the faculty show, said, that's a lot of tiles. Still lives are also a major part of my works and I've done a number of still lives over the years. I keep returning to still lives. These are a pot of sunflowers, which I've painted at least a dozen times, not the same sunflowers, but different sunflowers. Uh, I was having some work done at the house and there was somebody who came to the house to redo the floor in the basement. And he looked at the pot of uh, the, the vase with the sunflowers and he said, uh, Tom, those are dead. Those are really bad. You should throw those out. I said, no, no, no. They just start to get really interesting now. And it's that form that they start to take on and the deeper, richer color uh, that I'm looking for. So uh, although they might be hanging over the edge and they're closing up, I wanted to capture something that has an expressive and wily form uh, in these sunflowers that are coming out of a vase, which I still have today. So that's uh, the one of several sunflower paintings that led to this one, which incorporated a Zapotec carpet from Southern Mexico, 
and I'll talk a little bit more about Mexico later, uh, but this is one of three Zapotec carpets incorporated with the sunflower, uh, which just seemed to uh, beg to be put together between the design of the carpet and uh, the beauty of the sunflowers, which I've come to start growing myself in the backyard. They're really easy to grow with the right seeds and keeping the squirrels and the rabbits and the other uh, wildlife that like to come into my yard here uh, so close to the preserve. Another still life, this is a bag of oranges. And I really had a great time painting that mesh. And I find that the linear quality of the mesh would also return in some of my paintings in the power lines in some of the paintings, which I'll point out in a moment. This was for a specific show that a really great guy who was running the gallery at Farmingdale uh, had designed. Uh, he devised this idea to do a theme of orange. And this was about uh, five or six years ago. Uh, the theme orange was how all of the faculty were linked into this exhibition. And they also had to be 12 by 12 inches square. So I thought, ah, oh, square format. I love that. So I did a literal painting of oranges. The one on the right is cut and there's some wedges, uh, but it's the bag that fascinated me and the way that the bag wraps around those oranges uh, with those topographical lines. And my drawing students will relate, relate to the topographical lines that describe the form and the structure that are underneath those lines. And then inheriting this conch shell from one of the colleges that I teach at, uh, this is something that I put in a number of student still life drawings, and they always struggled with that conch shell. It wound up looking like an ear or some rotten piece of fruit, never like a shell. So I decided, okay, I'm going to paint this shell. I know it's paintable, and I extracted as much color out of this as possible. And a lot of what I do is related to other things in my life. And I believe in this theory of flow from studio practice to uh, what one does in the classroom, to what one does traveling, bringing it back to the studio practice. So having as many things connected, is very important to me as all things are symbiotic and they start to interconnect and interrelate. So a lot of my studio practice is then transferred back to my teaching methodology and vice versa. So this was done as an example for students, uh, but also something that I wanted to do. So in 2007, I was cured from renting from New York City landlords for the rest of my life. I never have to do that again. And after 18 years renting from New York City landlords, uh, who should never go into politics or anything else, uh, I came out to Long Island where I was raised and lived uh, much of my life and where I was teaching. And it just made more sense to return to Long Island and I bought a house and I built a studio in the back of the house in an old barn uh, that's a hundred years old. And I hired a friend of mine from high school to gut that barn and to insulate it, put electricity and uh, sheetrock inside and uh, overhead uh, windows, which you see in the painting. And this is the view of the studio, 400 square foot space that I work in today. Uh, and I've been working there for the past 13 years. So with all of those paintings that I did inspired by New York City, we'll see what happens to a city painter when he moves out to Long Island. You start to paint Long Island scenes and Long Island is one of the most beautiful places in the world. We're on an island and there's so much to paint here and I'm really happy being closer to nature, a block away from the Mutton Town Preserve and near the beaches and this is Montauk. Uh, this is the amusement park at Farmingdale. This is the Syosset train station before they put that terrible sculpture in the front of it. Uh, a couple of the local Oyster Bay sites. This is the church that Teddy Roosevelt used to go to and Teddy Roosevelt's summer White House on the corner of Main Street in downtown Oyster Bay. Every Thursday night before my night class, where I would teach a painting class at Nassau Community College, picking up an extra course uh, semester to semester, I would go to Thomas's Diner on Old Country Road. And I got the same window seat around four o'clock when the diner was empty. And I would look at this diner sign and the power lines that fascinated me for the same reason that the mesh around the oranges fascinated me, the way they are taut and stretched. 
Uh, but that awning for the diner is my anti-Edward Hopper painting. Uh, Hopper painted inside the diner. This is the exterior of the diner from the perspective of the person in the diner. So that's Thomas's diner on Old Country Road. For those of you who know me, uh, I haven't been there for a while with this lockdown and pandemic. I don't eat out very much anymore, but I used to go here every Thursday night as it was a regular staple of my routine just before class. Huntington, I don't think any of those stores are there any longer. And I'm still just a short car ride away from the outer boroughs, uh, 12 miles from the county line of Queens and then some of the best architecture uh, that hasn't been disturbed by modern buildings that just don't have any aesthetic quality like these older buildings. So a lot of the warehouses around the 59th Street Bridge and wonderful billboards became subject matters. This is the Eagle Electric that was painted in Queens. Uh, this is underneath the Brooklyn Bridge Park, looking north towards the Williamsburg Bridge. And the further north you go in Dumbo, you get to Vinegar Hill, where things have not transformed like the rest of Dumbo, which is a little bit too uh, antiseptic these days. But going north towards Vinegar Hill, there's still that character of the old warehouse buildings uh, where they wanted to put the artists for my building in 2007. The problem was it was next to the Phoenix halfway house, an electrical power plant, and the garbage recycling dump. So I thought Long Island would be a much, much better choice. And that's why I moved out to Long Island. But I can always go back and paint those areas. This is from Queens, and this is from Queens, near the Queensboro Plaza, also from the Queensboro Plaza. And going back to Dumbo, all the way north towards Vinegar Hill, where I find the architecture a lot more of my liking. Unfortunately, the building on the left was under construction at the time, and it's since become one of those really ugly modern buildings that transforms the character of what brought me to Dumbo in the first place in 1990. And that's looking all the way south towards one main street, that's the green top building left of center, and you can see the overpass of the Manhattan Bridge, blue structure in the middle. The outer borough of the Bronx also appealed to me, and I've been meeting friends and family at Arthur Avenue for 30 years or more. There's a favorite restaurant that we always go to. And then a block over, there's an old style bakery called Adios, which has been there for almost 100 years. So on the corner of Hughes, I was just drawn to represent this building. The light and a number of other things are completely invented. Uh, the cars, uh, you can't paint the Bronx without putting cars in. There's very few places unless you're painting the river. Uh, so that's the exception. There's not too many cars in my paintings, nor is there much traffic or pedestrians, uh, but I wanted these to be psychological spaces, spaces that invite the viewer to move through mentally and be able to walk through these spaces beyond the four sides of the picture plane. And while I'm still rooted in that square format, the two by two format, uh, this painting from 2019 is one of the three paintings currently at the Heckscher Museum Long Island Biennial Exhibition, along with the work that we saw earlier, the Long Island Expressway inspired work, and one more that I'll show you before we finish up tonight. The next two works are 20 years apart, but they represent the same small hilltop village in Tuscany, a place called San Gimignano. And this was painted in 1997, I returned in 2017 and I painted San Gimignano again. And I happened to be there during a full moon, uh, the sunset, and it was one of the most inspiring moments in a trip that I had made in 2017. So I committed to uh, this panel, also a square format. It's a 12 by 12 panel, uh, but it's San Gimignano, a place that keeps calling me back. And I've come to know this little hilltop town pretty well over the years and the Tuscan trees and landscape and the wine country is something that I find very inviting that keeps calling me back to paint it over and over again. This is also from Tuscany in the Chianti wine country, a small town called San Quirico. And San Quirico is where 
an old college friend was having a concert outside in a summer evening. He invited me out to hear his group of ensemble. He plays the cello and I went out and heard him play. We then went out to dinner. But there was this one road that just drew me. And while he was rehearsing with the band, I had a couple of hours to kill. Uh, so I sat down by the side of the road and just drew this little scene of San Curico. And there happens to be a bishop's house in this town that I've been looking at for investment property, maybe uh, my next studio space. Uh, that building on the far left really is as close to the road as it looks. It's literally this far from the street. So any sloppy driver who's on his cell phone might just clip that building. That's not the building I'm looking to buy, but it's the Bishop's house, uh, a little bit more in the pastoral area. This was inspired from a trip that I took to Nice, and I stayed in a hilltop town where cars cannot travel. There's no space for cars. It was designed long before the invention of the automobile, and in this small little Renaissance town overlooking uh, the southern Mediterranean in France, I stayed here for Bastille Day in 2016. We were supposed to go to Nice the next day. There was a terrible, terrible terrorist attack where some madman drove a lorry across the boardwalk. Uh, so we got out of Nice pretty quickly, and that changed a lot of plans that I was su supposed to paint in Arles and Avignon. And I've not yet rescheduled that trip, but that's in the near horizon. I'd like to get back to uh, Arles, Avignon, and Aix-en-Provence, uh, which was cut short from that uh, unfortunate trip. From that trip, though, in 2016, going back into Italy, uh, there was something that kept mesmerizing me. It was those rolled up haystacks uh, that appealed to Monet 100 years ago, uh, but were calling me to do something with them. And these are from the fields uh, between the drive we made from Pisa to Nice and then back again. And drawing these in the car and just taking note of them, I love the way that the light hit them and the color that is uh, just so uh, typical of the southern part of uh, the, the Riviera there. This is from the wine country in Piedmont in northwestern Italy, where we stayed and uh, actually participated in a tasting menu at the Germano Vineyard. No relation to me, uh, but I couldn't resist staying at a place that made Germano wine, and they were just as curious about me as I was about them. We determined that we're probably not related, but maybe we are, you never know. So this is the Barolo region of Piedmont, where I stayed and had just a, a great experience and was treated like family, even though I wasn't. In uh, Civita di Bagnoreggio, which is in Umbria, uh, I visited this place with a good friend and we walked to this Etruscan hilltop town. Very few people know about this place, but I have a good friend whose wedding I attended the following year and presented this as a wedding gift in 2016, I believe. Uh, but this was from a visit that I had made in 2016. And we had a walk across that long bridge that you see on the bottom, and no cars can enter into Civita di Bagnoreggio because it's an Etruscan hilltop town. Most people who visit Umbria would know Orvieto and Oret, uh, Assisi, which are more populated with tourists, but this is one of the best kept secrets. But I'm telling all of you, uh, but make sure that uh, you don't take the last hotel room before I go back because this is just an incredible place. Uh, my friend who got married actually has a family house there. His in-laws, the family that he married into, uh, his, his mother-in-law grew up in this place. And most people who live there have second homes because it's so inaccessible and not exactly modernized, as you can imagine. But it's an Etruscan hilltop town that was just amazing to walk through. And I believe we ate in an Etruscan wine cellar about 20 meters beneath the ground uh, with a good friend that uh, time. This was the first of three paintings that I painted from the same window that I rented on at least three, maybe four different occasions now. Yeah, I think it's four because I was back in 2019 and I asked to stay in the same apartment uh, in 2019. 
uh, same building, but I don't know. In 2019, I didn't get the same apartment, but three different paintings resulted from the top story apartment in Lucca with a view of the tower of what's called San Martino, the Cathedral of Lucca. And there was something about this that kept drawing me back. So uh, we'll come back to this same subject. That's first a 12 inch square, but then resulted in another painting done in that apartment. And then a final painting that's the largest done in my studio here, that's 40 by 32 inches. We'll come back to that. But my time in Lucca was uh, by invitation to teach a painting workshop. And going there from about uh, 2013 or 2014 uh, for four or five consecutive summers, I brought groups of students there. And then in 2017, I decided, okay, no students, but why don't I just go there and do all the painting that I want in all the time that I can paint and not have to teach. So this is a couple of groups where I'm teaching and that's my niece in the foreground in the light blue shirt, uh, whose birthday it is today, and other students from Farmingdale who attended uh, that painting workshop in Lucca a few years ago. And this was a plein air painting workshop where I got to paint, but I had to teach. So by teaching, I was earning my keep, but also limited in the number of paintings that I could do. By 2017, I decided well, I'm just gonna paint for three weeks. And I rented the apartment in Luca and painted the view from the window and walked to different parts of the streets of the town. It's a walled town, still intact. And I averaged about two or three paintings a day. And on the same trip, I went to Venice and to Rome uh, where I produced about 24 paintings in a three week period. Uh, we'll see some of those in a moment, but this is one of the bridges that I painted in Borgo e Mozzano four different times. This was the last time I painted it in 2017. This is the tower in Borgo e Mozzano where the studio is located. And this is the view out of the back porch of the studio at the mountainside all in Tuscany on the west coast of that Tuscan city. Now the plein air paintings are a lot rougher and a lot looser. And it's one of the things that I like about painting on location and getting all of the information down right in front of the motif. It's so important for a painter to work from direct observation rather than getting stale or stiff or bringing these things back to the studio. And I would never work from just a photograph. I have to have an experience and I have to have a direct observation and ex an experience with that place and an emotional attachment for it to be meaningful as a place to paint. And Luca became that for those four or five years that I returned culminating in that very productive period in 2017, of which you'll see in the next series of paintings. Uh, so this is the most populated street in all of Luca. It's Filalunga Street and Boya. Uh, I can't tell you how many people tried to stretch their neck around me where I nestled my easel in such a way that people couldn't stand behind me because nothing is worse than somebody looking over your shoulder, judging what you're doing. So I try to nestle my easel and myself with a building behind me so nobody can get around. But usually seven or eight year olds find a way, they knock over the turpentine, spill your paints, and they get to see what they need to see and usually uh, get dragged away by a parent for interrupting the artist. But Italy is one of the most generous places for artists to live and work as Italians I think have a great appreciation of the creative arts. This is also from that same trip in 2017. And this is the San Giovanni, where they hold the longest running music festival today, uh, dedicated to Puccini, who is a native son of Luca. This is the San Giovanni, the Baptistry of Luca, painted plein air on location. And that's me doing that painting uh, with my good friend, Rob Vanderhoff, uh, who joined me on part of that 2017 painting uh, ex uh, expedition. And Rob has a car, so we actually were able to drive out of Luca for a couple of painting expeditions. And he's married with a kid, so he can only stay for three days, but he uh, set up his own easel and painted alongside of me. This was a day that uh, an Australian tourist asked if he could photograph uh, what I was doing. So I said, yeah, sure, okay. 
But otherwise, you can see that I've set myself up with the wall behind me, not wanting people to bend their neck around. So for that guy, I made an exception. He photographed me and then went on his own way, but was kind enough to send me that photograph, uh, which I think uh, captured a, a nice uh, photograph of Rob looking over my shoulder as uh, Rob Ziesel is the one to the left there. And in the background is San Martino, the cathedral. That's San Frediano, which I remember like it happened an hour ago. I set up in this plaza early on a Sunday morning, about eight o'clock, and nobody was there. And by 9.30, 10, it was a crowded piazza. And there was one organist who played this electric organ, and he knew four songs, and he played them over and over again, including the Godfather theme. And I was going to give him the biggest tip of his life if he would not play anymore, maybe move to another part of the town. But as somebody working outside, you have to adopt uh, what's going on around you, block out everything that might be distracting, like the Godfather theme played a few dozen times, and also block out people and try to work very fast because the light is constantly changing. So that's San Frediano, named for the Irish monk who came to Lucca, Italy. And this is the piazza right around the block from where my hotel was. And this is uh, San Sebastian, also on, across town, uh, dedicated to the plague victims. That one happens to have a nun walking through the space as it was something that I saw and I just thought she belongs in that painting. There are ancient Roman ruins on the bottom foreground too, uh, which, is the foundation for the San Sebastian Church. Uh, this is San Salvatore, and the building on the right is the repository for the ambulance building. And on the far left is the best gelato stand in all of Lucca, which I visit as often as I can, as often as I go. But getting back to the ambulance place on the right, uh, some of the ambulance drivers came over to me and asked if I was going to put the ambulances into my painting. And I said, uh, no, no, I, I don't think so. So he was a little disappointed because he had uh, driven that ambulance and wanted to be part of the painting, but ambulances are a little bit too modern. And I think the thing that attracts me to Europe and Italy in particular is the historic quality. And there's no place for ambulances in a historic timeless uh, place such as Lucca. This is the second of the views out of the apartment window looking towards the cathedral, San Martino. And then this is the final, the third painting that I did of the view out of the window. And I did this one from the two sketches that were done there. And then this one was done in my New York studio here on Long Island. It finished just uh, three years ago. In the fall of 2016 or 2017, Hard to remember as uh, if you ask me, COVID feels like it's gone on for 20 years. But sometime a few years ago, I was invited to be in a, an exhibition in New York City on the west side near the High Line. In fact, it was called the High Line Stages, a large space. And the curator had this idea to invite artists who painted on Metro cards. Now, a Metro card is this wide by this tall, it's the same size as a credit card, but with a diagonal slash through one of the sides. And that's the card that you swipe through the uh, access place into the subways and buses. So the show was called Single Fair, and the artist who exhibited in Single Fair showed these tiny paintings and it was a huge success. Uh, most of the show was sold out because they were all priced the same, and there were some famous artists and not so famous artists all in the show together, uh, but this was uh, what I did for the single fair, eight paintings that are a return to my visit in Lucca and in Italy. Uh, you'll see some references. The one in the middle is from Viterbo, where I stayed, and on the upper right is a return to that Civita di Bagnoreggio, and on the bottom left is that train station that again is painted from memory from Borgo e Mozzano. And then the rest of them are just fantasies of places I've seen and painting from memory in Italy. So looking up close, they're very textured because they're three inches by four inches wide. And this is what they look like from up close, the train station. And from the top of the wall in Luca, 
looking uh, at some of those umbrella pines. On the left, that's a hole that's punched into the metro cart. They all have those holes punched in as part of the design of the metro cart. And that's the detail of the Viterbo uh, Palazzo, which it has become a bed and breakfast where I stayed. And the Civita di Bagno Reggio, and just a fantasy on something that is very geometric in those uh, stripes of the fields and Italianate because of the Mediterranean pines. England is a place that I return to frequently as I have a very good friend from graduate school who lives in Richmond, London, and I always enjoy stopping over and seeing her when I travel to Europe. I have spent a lot of time and she stays here when uh, she visits New York. Uh, but this is a friend of mine who I have been in touch with for oh, over 30 years. And uh, by staying in Richmond for a number of years, I've become very familiar with the architecture and the scenery in and around the town of Richmond, which is south of London. Uh, so this is Sheen Road, which I just finished uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. And this is the council houses across from her apartment on Victoria Place. And both were done in Richmond, London. Uh, this was done on my uh, second trip to, no, I'm sorry, first trip with the NEH. After a trip in 2011, I had so many memories and uh, images in my sketchbook and in my mind of Mexico, which I had only first experienced in 2010. And I was avoiding Mexico and Central America out of partially fear and not really sure. I had been very familiar with Europe and I think I've traveled Europe more than I've traveled the United States by this point. But in 2010, I went to Mexico for the first time and I absolutely fell in love with Mexico. And I thought there's so much culture and the people are so great there and the color and the beauty and the art is amazing. So I've been going back to Mexico quite a bit and it's a place that keeps drawing me back, uh, first in 2010, 2011 for New Year's, and then in 2011, I received a grant through the National Endowment for the Humanities to study Maya culture for five weeks. And during that time, I stayed in Coba, where I painted this uh, painting a few years later based on my reflections and my memories. So this must be from about 2014, 2015, and I was quite uh, impressed with all of these uh, Seventh-day Advent churches that were popping up all over the place and holding masses at 11 p.m. on a Saturday night. I thought, hmm, this is interesting, a crowd that's uh, going to church at that hour. Watercolors has long been one of my mediums. I started with watercolor when I was maybe eight or nine years old as my uh, I call that my gateway drug into art from watercolors. I then graduated into acrylics where I was painting denim jackets. And then it wasn't until I got to college where my junior year professor said, we're, we're working in oil paints here. And I was forced to work in oil paints and it's the medium that I love the most today. But watercolors have a fluidity and it's something which I really find a, a great medium to work with. This was something that was based on uh, my nephew's passion and uh, pastime playing uh, a little league uh, version of uh, hockey. He's quite a good hockey player. And this was something that I gifted him. Uh, this was done in 2017 as uh, I don't consider myself political in my art. There's enough ugliness in the world that I don't want to add to that in art, but I did happen to notice that there's certainly a lot of people who are not paying attention or perhaps ignoring some of the obvious things in our political world. That's all I'll say about that. And that's how the ostrich with his head in the ground uh, came about. Uh, this was a watercolor that preceded a much larger work for uh, an invited exhibition that I was in uh, it, to commemorate the 20th anniversary since the Civil War in Guatemala. And having traveled to Guatemala a couple of times and studying the Maya, uh, my friends in uh, Los Angeles who were in the academic community had invited me to participate in an exhibition 
at the College, uh, University of California in Northridge. And this is a small sketch, nine inches by six inches, that uh, shows the flying of kites, which is a tradition in Guatemala that bridges this world with the spiritual world up above. And it was a phenomenon that I was interested in, as well as the wall of the forgotten or the disappeared. Now, the exhibition was called Memoria, and it was the memory of 20 years of peace in Guatemala. The 30 by 22 inch watercolor, which is significantly bigger, allowed me to get a little bit more specific with all of those portraits on the wall. And the portraits were a public art project that was undertaken to create Xerox copies of the photographs of all of the disappeared people. And there were a lot of disappeared people tens of thousands during Guatemala's uh, ethnic cleansing that took place under Rios Mat. Uh, and it was an unfortunate event because most of those who were being cleansed from society were ethnic Maya. Uh, and Guatemala has a large, probably the largest population of the Maya live in Guatemala today. So as uh, 50 or 60,000 disappeared and were killed or just uh, incinerated and put into mass graves, this public art project could be seen in Zone 1, which is around the capital of Guatemala City, as a protest and a reminder, a memorial of those who disappeared and were gone for more than 20 years, so were presumed dead. When I showed this, I did not think that I was doing a specific portrait of anyone. I was just stream of consciousness doing portraits of indigenous people from Guatemala who I had seen in my travels in 2012 and again in 2014 and again in 2015 or 16. So making three trips through the years to Guatemala, I got pretty familiar with what Guatemalans look like. And the reaction that this piece uh, got was completely unexpected, where my colleagues in Los Angeles said, oh, you did the portrait of this one, the one that disappeared in the so-and-so, or the person who was the father of six that um, had that uh, accident that was that, that led to this. So none of these people were based on anything, no photographs or no specific portraits. I was just doing composites of uh, what I saw as indigenous Guatemalans. But the connection, whether it was uh, subliminal or uh, projected by the viewers was quite an interesting one that I had never expected. And that's uh, the piece that it was related in the Memoria exhibition uh, about two and a half years ago in commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the Civil War and the end of the war in Guatemala. Now this year uh, has been probably one of the most prolific years of my life. And what else is an artist going to do during a lockdown period? Paint and make art. So uh, if you're an artist and you haven't been productive this year, you'll never be productive. I mean, there's a lot of things going on and there's a lot of things that can distract you. But uh, this year I've done quite a bit of work and it's ongoing. I've got about 30 projects going on in the studio at once. Uh, this was for a book project that was commissioned by the American Labor Museum, and it's a children's book that uh, the author wrote. There was a historian, Steve Dolan, from New Jersey, who checked the facts behind the book. There was the American Labor Museum director and the head of education that was all part of this project, and I was brought in as the artist. And it was a great team to work with because the director of the American Labor Museum is somebody that I had a show with 28 years ago. And she later told me I was the first artist who showed when she first came in as a director. And she's a wonderful person, Angelica Santamoro. And uh, she's somebody that I still work with today. So as the director of the American Labor Museum, she knew my art from a labor series that I had done in the early 90s, exhibited it, and then asked me to be part of this book project that tells the story of the 1913 Patterson Silk Strike, which is a factual event from labor history. So I'll zip through some of these. There were uh, 16 paintings that were done for this series, and they follow the path of these two children who are getting ready for school while some of their uh, similar 
age group are getting ready to go to work. That's the Doherty Mill, where a lot of the silk workers in Patterson, New Jersey worked. These are the two boys who stayed with their aunt going to work at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, 12 year olds were going into the factory. And these are the types of machines that they worked on. These are the immigrant workers that were a little bit upset that new machines were going to replace them. So they had to do something and they staged a strike. Uh, this is the Patterson Falls, which still fall today, something that Alexander Hamilton had recognized as a great source of energy and power back in the 18th century. And that's what brought the Industrial Revolution to Patterson, New Jersey, which is one of the last vestiges of the Industrial Revolution so close to where we are today. These are the strikers in the street, some famous characters like Big Bob uh, Haywood, Bill Hay Haywood, uh, and a number of other characters, children, women, and men who took to the streets to protest. And the strikers were jailed, and like uh, oftentimes, uh, workers have less rights than the owners who really gave them the shakedown, and Patterson was very hostile to their striking workers. In fact, the mayor was so hostile that the workers could not meet in Patterson, so they met in the adjacent town called Haldon. And Haldon is where the American Labor Museum is located today, in what's called the Bottle House Historical Site. And that's the house that's in this painting. There's a lot more buildings around it today, but these are the strikers who are gathering. And there were a number of speakers, including Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Sinclair Lewis, a famous author, who addressed the strikers from the balcony of the, uh, the Bottle House, which is now the American Labor Museum. Uh, these are some of the people addressing the strikers down below. These are the parents who could no longer afford to keep their children. They sent the children away to live with families who were willing to take in these workers' children in New York City and the surrounding areas. And the IWW would uh, sponsor the uh, bus that would take these children into New York City and other parts. Uh, this was one of the posters that was created. And then I simply appropriated the original poster, which is owned by the American Labor Museum, done in 1913 to advertise the pageant of the Patterson strike, uh, which was in Madison Square Garden in New York City. And this is where the strikers staged their own uh, story on the stage of Madison Square Garden. And the backdrop for that stage was designed by John Sloan, one of my favorite artists, a uh, good friend of Edward Hopper, and one of the Ashcan artists of the early 20th century. Uh, John Sloan did the backdrop and a number of uh, workers staged their own story. So in the end, they went back to work. Things were not a whole lot better. They were lucky to have their jobs back. Uh, the uh, owners lost a lot. The workers lost a lot. And in the end, what was gained was a new type of contract that some of the workers had. This is uh, going over the contract and the rights of the workers that couldn't be maltreated. And also what was gained was no more child labor. And children started to go back to school at 12 years old, rather than to the factory to work to raise money for the family, poor immigrant families of the time. So these are the children that are going back to school rather than to the factory at 5.30 in the morning. And this is the solidarity symbol and the IWW on the upper left on a few different backgrounds. And that's the works for the uh, Patterson strike, uh, which uh, granted me a course load reduction last semester but a lot of work in the studio. Mostly watercolors, just two oils uh, that you saw amongst those. In May, the postal strike from 1996-97 uh, was featured on the front cover of this book by Philip Rubio. And the last of these uh, works are my drawings. And in the age of pandemic, one wears a mask, not as a political statement, but common sense. It's common sense to wear a mask. So. Wearing a mask was a self-portrait. Uh, working from the live model is something that during the pandemic was just not possible anymore. So I was a little bit at a loss when I lost uh, access to the college. I wasn't teaching on the college. We were teaching remotely, which is a little bit odd, very weird to teach drawing and painting remotely as opposed to hands-on in the classroom and not being in a studio with a live model because of the social distancing. But what I did before with the live model has been substituted with Zoom models, which I'm working from today. There's a wonderful model who I've met 
She's an Australian woman working in Holland, and there's a group of 200 some odd artists who zoom in and uh, pay a small fee to work from the model uh, three times a week. So that's what I've been doing since June. These are some of the figure studies that I've done from that model during the pandemic session. She's very uh, inventive with different cameras. Sometimes she does uh, poses that are uh, inspired by different artists, but that's uh, drawing to me is one of the most important things that a visual artist can continue doing because it's the drawing that feeds the painting, the watercolors, the oil paintings, whatever it may be. Uh, portraits were also something that I continued doing and using my niece on the left, uh, who some of you might have seen was the woman in the Edward Hopper exhibition in Virginia. Uh, she's my niece from Florida. She sat for that via Zoom portrait, and I did that from a, a video camera, and then translated into the uh, computer, and then back to the model in uh, the Zoom in the past uh, several months. And that was just last Thursday, less than a week ago on the right, and an earlier work from the same model via Zoom uh, in this new age that we find ourselves in. Now, in uh, wrapping up the presentation, I do want to show you a quick presentation of a working method of how I develop my painting. So I'm going to uh, do something a little bit different here. And we're going to go to, uh, hopefully this will work. Let's see if I can uh, go to something. Whoop. I'm going to actually... Hopefully you see a blank canvas on the easel right now. Did that just come up? Yes? Okay. Yeah. So people ask me how I go about creating a painting. And this is a time-lapse painting in 35 seconds that goes from start to finish, explaining to maybe the neophyte who's not used to the studio practice of how an artist goes about creating a painting from start to finish. So we'll start this here. And this was a demonstration that I did for my painting students who I'm teaching remotely these days. But I learned this in graduate school from William Bailey that you block out the darks and you go from dark to light throughout the entire painting. And then you tweak the color as you go along, but you don't get wrapped up in any one place. You have to move around the composition and the painting from start to finish is something that develops in a manner that should be worked on all over without going to the details first. And I probably made every painting mistake. I tell this to my students, mistakes are learning opportunities. Uh, but that's the painting from start to finish in 35 seconds. I'm really not that fast, but that's a time lapse that's about uh, one shot every minute. So that's the first 35 minutes of a painting, just establishing all of the color, the lights and the darks. And that's the way that I work from direct observation from life. Okay, uh, we'll wrap this up with uh, the last of our paintings today. Let's see now. Are you able to see a multicolored uh, light uh, lifeguard house here? Did that come back on again? No. No. It didn't. Okay. So let me stop the share with the easel, and I'm going to go back to uh, the last images from the presentation. Hopefully, it's come up now. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. And let me just hit uh, full screen as we uh, look at the last of these. Okay. Uh, so this is what is on my easel right now in my studio. It's uh, painted from memory from a trip that I made to Los Angeles in December. And while you've noticed tonight that a lot of my paintings are inspired by travel and places that I've gone and places that I've visited, uh, there's none of that in the last seven months with the lockdown and Americans are not allowed out of America because uh, other countries find that we have not taken care of the COVID problem. So a lot of my paintings are more based on memory and less based on direct observation. And this is what's on the easel today. This is what's the third painting at the Heckscher Museum. It was started in 2010, continued in 2014, when I returned to Mexico City and then finished this year during the pandemic and submitted to the Heckscher Long Island Biennial. And it's one of the three paintings that 
I mentioned are in the show uh, through January the 10th. It's Mexico City from, again, my hotel room, looking at the back of the cathedral uh, towards the National Palace on the left and the Zocalo uh, just behind on the other side of the cathedral. Uh, and I title this piece Tenochtitlan, which is the ancient name for uh, Mexico City given by the Aztecs, as this is right on the Aztec capital and a half a block from the Plaza Mayor uh, Museum, right on top of Aztec ruins. Uh, so I feel there's an energy to this place that associates it with the pre-Columbian culture that lived there before. And this last painting that I'll show you is also a recent uh, completed work that I finished just earlier this month, small 12 by 12 square, once again, uh, from a friend's balcony looking towards Hempstead Harbor, uh, which I've mentioned earlier. Long Island has a lot of places that are very paintable, not just urban spaces or European spaces, but Long Island has a lot of appeal to me and nature as well as the beauty of our surrounding spaces. Uh, so I find Long Island just as inspiring as Europe and uh, Dumbo and New York City, which I've painted throughout my career. So thank you very much for your attention this evening.